Thank you for coming today. Welcome to the Brooklyn Museum. Um, thank you for being here for Becoming Miss Burton, Reentry, Healing, and a New Way of Life. My name is Rebecca Taffel. I am the Director of Programs at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. And I'm so happy that you're here for this important conversation. It's, it's really thrilling to have, to have our panelists here today. Susan Burton has been called a national treasure by Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times and a modern day Harriet Tubman by Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow. It's very clear once you read her memoir, Becoming Miss Burton, which hopefully you all got copies of when you walked in, um, that these descriptions are more than fitting. Her journey has made a, her a powerful advocate for ending mass incarceration, for imagining and most importantly, enacting systemic change. Um, we are honored to have you here today, so thank you very much for being here to share your story, your truth, and ultimately your triumph. Um, we're equally honored to have Topeka K. Sam and Corey Green here, two formidable and fierce organizers based in New York City, to add their own stories and to join her in conversation. And of course, to guide the discussion, we have our moderator, Cecilia Clark, president of the Brooklyn Community Foundation. So thank you all very, very much. This is the final program in 2017 of the ongoing series, States of Denial, the Illegal Incarceration of Women, Children, and People of Color, which is produced by the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. The foundation began the series here at the Sackler Center in March 2014, and all of our previous programs are available online as well as other Sackler Center programmings um, at our website, which is www.brooklynmuseum.org slash EASCFA slash video. Um, if you're interested in joining our mailing list in order to receive updates about this programming since the series is ongoing, um, just find me uh, after the program, give me a business card or your email address. Um, we will start up again in the spring of 2018. Our next program will be March. Um, a big thank you, huge thank you to our partners on this program, both vitally important organizations located here in New York, the New Press, and Brooklyn Community Foundation. And lastly, one more note of thanks for Novo Foundation, who has supported this programming series and continues to, pour, uh, to support this current 2017-2018, um, these programs. So um, just quick sort of housekeeping information. After the panelists finish their discussion, there'll be time for questions from the audience. Um, there are two microphones on each aisle. And then following that, Susan will be available on stage to sign copies of her book. And we ask that when that time comes, you line up on the right side of the auditorium. And now, I'd like to start the program and welcome Cecilia Clark to the stage to take us into today's conversation. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm so delighted to be here. This is our fourth partnership with the Sackler Center. Uh, so thank you so much, Rebecca and Elizabeth, who, who couldn't make it. And our third with Sackler and New Press um, for the States of Denial series. So it's an immense honor to be able to be the Brooklyn Community Foundation and partner with the amazing Brooklyn Museum and the Sackler Center. So we are the Community Foundation for Brooklyn, and we partner with generous Brooklynites, innovative nonprofits, and community leaders to take on Brooklyn's most pressing challenges and to spark lasting change. One of the ways we do that is by bringing together change makers in critical conversations like the one we're about to do. So I'm going to ask uh, Susan and Topeka and Corey to come up and introduce all of, all of you to them. So you heard a little bit about Susan from Rebecca, but Susan is the founder and executive director of A New Way of Life, a nonprofit that provides sober housing and other support to formerly incarcerated women. She's nationally known as an advocate for restoring basic civil and human rights to those who have served time. She was a winner of AARP's prestigious Purpose Prize and has been a Starbucks upstander, a CNN top 10 hero, a Soros Justice Fellow, and a Women's Policy Institute Fellow at the California Wellness Foundation. 
She's the co-author with Carrie Lynn of Becoming Miss Burton from the New Press, and she lives in Los Angeles. Topeka Sam is the founder and executive director of the Ladies of Hope Ministries, whose mission is to help disenfranchised and marginalized women and girls transition back into society through spiritual empowerment, education, entrepreneurship, and advocacy. She's also the co-founder of Hope House NYC, a safe housing space for women and girls based on the model of New Way of Life. She is a Beyond the, Beyond the Bars 2015 Fellow and a 2016 Justice in Education Scholar at Columbia University, a 2017 Soros Justice Advocacy Fellow working on probation and parole accountability, and a founding member of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Corey Green is a formerly incarcerated co-founder and healing justice organizer with How Our Lives Link All Together, HALA. A, <laughs> HALA. HALA. <laughs> a, uh, I'm very proud to say um, HALA is a Brooklyn Community Foundation grantee. And they are committed to working for a world where young people from historically oppressed communities are engaged in movements of deep relationship building, transformation, and resistance. Corey is currently invested in developing and supporting the development of an intergenerational youth-led citywide healing justice movement. Corey is also the community researcher and training manager with the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions. He's also a PhD candidate at the Graduate Center CUNY and a loving father. Thank you. Today's conversation and our featured panelists embody a belief we hold at the Brooklyn Community Foundation, that those who are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. It's a belief that is often best illustrated when it comes to our criminal justice system. Susan, Topeka, and Corey's journeys to where they are today are surely different, but they share the same basic experience of being failed by a system of so-called justice the praise upon communities of color all across the country. And yet, they are all here today because they took that experience, that deep injustice that sought to break them down and defeat them, and instead turned it into a commitment to healing and repairing the lives of others who are going through the same experience. There's so much to talk about today, and I also want to acknowledge and honor the young people here today are any young people? Ron? Yes, 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 yes from yes, Hala yes, yes, yes. and also from Atlas, um, two of our grantees. Both fantastic organizations we're so proud to support at the foundation. We really look forward to them opening our audience Q&A in a bit and keeping us honest and accountable in this conversation as young people are so wonderful at doing. So let's begin by hearing your stories and how you came to found your organizations respectively, New Way of Life, Ladies of Hope, and how our lives link together. Take it away. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really, really honored to be here. And I want to give a shout out to the um, Goodard Social Justice um, Book Prize. A new, uh, Becoming Miss Burton uh, won the Book of the Year Prize from the Goodard Foundation. And I had the opportunity to meet the person it was named after. Could you stand and let's give you a hand. It is the first, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you. So A New Way of Life was um, founded out of my lifetime of pain, trauma, and incarceration. So, um, you know, I experienced so much um, violence and trauma um, as a kid growing up, as a young girl, uh, as a young woman, and then as a mother. My five-year-old son was uh, accidentally killed by LAPD police off a LAPD detective, and I just could not hold any more pain. I began to drink. That escalated to a drug, uh, drug use, illegal drug use. The war on drugs was just ascending upon our community. There was illegal drugs, crack everywhere, and I medicated my pain and my grief. 
and for that I was incarcerated. I was incarcerated over and over and over again over a 16-year um, period, and I spent a total of 20 years under the, um, the, the, the authority of the California Department of Corrections. And then I found help in uh, Santa Monica, about five miles down the 10 freeway, was a world away from South LA, where resources were plentiful. Uh, I landed a bed in an upscale drug treatment program a couple of blocks from the beach. I began to get therapy every week. I was introduced to the 12-step program. And I thought, what a concept. Why don't we have this in South LA? So I left that treatment center and came back to South LA, landed a job, saved my money, bought a house, and uh, went down to the bus station where women were getting off the bus. My friends, uh, my community who were also cycling in and out of prison. And as they walked off the bus, I'd say, hey girl, I have a house. And if you want a bed there, you know, you can have one. And we uh, created a community of women helping women, formerly incarcerated women, sharing our resources, sharing our defeat, sharing our joys. And uh, that, out of that born was, was created a new way of life reentry project. So uh, that's almost 20 years ago. And over the, that time, the houses have multiplied. We, um, put in um, uh, legal services. We have uh, six attorneys on staff. We do advocacy, policy, organizing, leadership development, and a new way of life is um, a model for our country, a proven model of what could be and should be in every community to welcome people back. Round of applause, amazing story. So I think that's a good segue to you, Topeka. Yeah, for sure. Because of the model. Yeah. Yes, thank you <laughs> also for having me here. Thank you, Susan. I'm Corey. So my journey uh, started, I guess when I went to college, really. Um, I was raised in New York, in Manorville, Long Island. Um, had every opportunity. My parents were franchise business owners, still together after 50 years. And I went to Baltimore to go to college because I wanted to be um, at HBCU, a historically black university, because we were the only black family in our neighborhood and I wanted to be around other, other people that looked like me. And so I got to Baltimore and um, I just started kind of veering off of campus and started going into the city. And I guess what seemed to be exciting for me, I got really, really heavy engaged in. And so I would continue to hit the criminal legal system, whether it was get arrested, um, and I would kind of have probation, and then it would stop, and then I would go back to school, and this whole cycle, trying to find myself or where I thought I belonged. And so um, years later, I ended up in prison for a conspiracy drug charge. And I thought all the while that people took drugs because they wanted to. People took drugs, it was their choice, and they just made this decision and that was it. And it wasn't until I was incarcerated in the county jail in 2012 that I realized that that was not the case. That women were being criminalized um, and it was this history of abuse. It was violence, trauma, um, just like Susan shared, something that had happened in their life and no access to resources, to health care. Um, to even someone to sit and talk to about their experience, landed this cycle with the war on drugs and everything else and had people coming in and out of prison. And I would see women come in and leave and come in and leave and then leave and never come back because they had overdosed and died. And so the more and more I talked to the women and they continued to tell me of these stories and experiences, um, I realized what I had done and what I had contributed within this construct. And so. I went through a healing process of my own, and I had reconnected with my higher power, which is God, and I forgave myself, and it started to go on my road to redemption, which then um, I ended up in Danbury, Connecticut, in federal prison, and the Ladies of Hope Ministries was birthed there. And so no matter what, who I spoke to, it was just this whole thought and cycle of needing spiritual development, healing, 
of this trauma that was even generational trauma that had happened. And at lack of resources, like I knew that when I had come home that I would have been able to transition because my parents were still together, so I had safe housing. Um, I had education, I had entrepreneurship skills, so I knew that I would come right back out and be okay with the resources and the friends that I had. But I also knew that that was a rarity and that many women wouldn't have had that same opportunity. So it was my obligation. I knew when I came home that I had to help other women through the transition so they would not go back to prison. And so while I was in, I met um, my partner, Vinay Sykes, who's here in the front row, Vinay. Um, yeah, we were in Danbury together and um, someone told me she wanted to do a house for women coming back to Brooklyn. And they're like, you need to talk to Vinay. So we talked and we started just talking about the vision and what we wanted to do. And the name came Hope House. And it was a scripture um, in Job that said, you know, even for a tree that if cut down, that it will sprout again and that the tender branches thereof will not tarry. You know, so if you give hope to anything, it will grow and it will not tarry and it will flourish. And so we decided that we were gonna move with that, with that thought. And when I was released in um, 2015 in May, I started organizing and moving around the country and still hearing the same thing, no housing, no jobs, no, no help. And um, I was told to reach out to Susan. I said, Susan has the model, she's doing the work. She's been doing it for 20 years. And so I did. And I called Susan and I said, really excited, you know, this is what I want to do. God said, this is what we have to do. And um, so she called me back and she was like, I want to help you. Like, you've been on my spirit. And, you know, I, I keep bringing spirit into the room because we're talking about healing and transformation. And um, she was like, I want to help. And she did. And, you know, you think about resources and you think about connectivity, you think about building coalition and how do you help other formerly incarcerated women. And it is providing that safe housing in that space, but it's also providing that assistance to start your organizations and help. And she did just that. And so, you know, I want to give Susan a round of applause because many people um, do not do that. They don't grab back. You know, they don't go into their own pockets and say, here. You know, I see what you're doing, I know that this works, and I want to help you. And not just talk about it, but she was about it. So we're here, and we were able to open Hope House, which is in the Bronx, and, um, on October 28th. And so we're really, really excited to move and really help to, to make women hold and provide them the access to the resources within the community. But when I say community, I really with, within our community of formerly incarcerated people, because we do know what we need in order to succeed. Thanks, Topeka. Thank you. Corey? Peace, what's up? Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Corey. And um, yeah, thanks to, um, to everybody who put this together and particularly like putting a panel together with formerly incarcerated um, leadership. So thanks BCF and everybody who organized this. Um, yeah, man, a story about me. I think like I'm an indigenous person and it's really hard to tell a story about me like just in my like physical lifetime because you don't really understand how trauma and how my connection to my mother and her mother, how that has shaped how I come to this work and how I, how I show up and how I've been um, battered and, and, um, and, and, and taught to internalize certain ideas and certain things that, certain ideas that lead to certain behaviors in myself and outside of myself. Um, so my mom's, so I'm gonna start my mom's and kind of like walk up a little bit to like how Holla was started. Um, my mom's was born in Mississippi in the 50s. Jackson, Mississippi, and um, you know, I like to identify myself as like old school black, you know, um, and I say old school black because like our blackness in this country starts with like the Atlantic Ocean, um, and it starts in the deep south, and like for us it was the Delta, Mississippi, um, and as we were trying to run to healing and run to reentry from slavery, from colonization, we was moving away from as far as south as we can go. We, I mean, far as north as we can go. And for us, it started at Jackson, Mississippi. That was a little bit away from the Delta. Then, you know, by the time my mom was 12, she found herself in Chicago. We started moving in Chicago. And we set up shop in Chicago. And by the time I was born, a little bit before I was born in the 80s, my mom, the, the, we, we done set up shop in New York. Um, but through those experiences, my mom at 12, she was like raising all her little siblings who were like nine, 10, four. Um, she was working um, because 
as a young person, this is how you show up and like, like to try to like support your family. So she was migrating, moving to different places to try to like help family. As we move and migrate away from the violence of the South and trying to move up, she was trying to take our family and be a young leader in the family and support it. And in the 80s, when she landed in New York, also, you know, there's real forces that we're running from, crack epidemic hit. And as my moms, who came out of the army, who was in Job Corps, who did all of the things that black people try to do to be good black people in the world, we, we just trying to like, we just trying to see, be seen as human. Like we can do this, we can go to school, we can work. She was trying to do all that. She wasn't organizing, but she was doing all the things in mainstream world that we say if we do those things. We should we should be seen as human. We should be seen as people. She was trying to do those things, and when she ended up in New York, out of out, out of the army. Um, she ran into crack, and it was all over our neighborhood. And for her, that one night turned into like 35 years ongoing of a struggle. And me being born three years after my mom was addicted to crack cocaine, um, I, I inherited um, um, the deep history that my mom's journey through and where she came from, and also the material consequences of, of like disinvestment in, in, in our neighborhoods. Um, that are facilitated through the war on drugs policy, but that is like, if you start there, that's not the beginning of the conversation either. No. You know what I'm saying? That's like a chapters, chapters are long. Mm -hmm. So, and I say this thing, and I say this because um, a lot of the stuff that I was living through and experiencing growing up, I thought was regular. I thought that, that made sense. When I was getting stopped by police at 12, 13, 14, six times a day, and every, I thought that was regular, that's what we go through. When my mom was going, like really struggling to make ends meet, I thought she was just a bad mother. I thought she just didn't do it, she just didn't get it. You know, so I started, when I, the things that we see in our neighborhood without deep like connection to like our history and who we are and, and what's being thrown at us, we start to really, and that's a violence. Because those things help shape who I could be. Could I be a father? If, if I think of myself in a certain light, I don't see myself as a father. I don't see myself as a PhD graduate. I don't see myself as an organizer holler. I can see myself robbing somebody from my hood to survive. Um, so I started internalizing deep things about my family, about my neighborhood, about myself, um, that really started to facilitate who I could be and, and how I showed up. And so what that means is when I was making high honor roll at like, what, what I stopped going to school at like 14, 15, when I was a high honor roll student, I made a conscious decision that like, this doesn't make sense. Like when I was going home, we wasn't eating. My mom's like lost rent money. Um, she's getting locked up and I got to um, um, and go into programs and then I got to go to people who are not really caring for me and I got to figure out how to eat. My little sister's like 12 now. So there's like so much going on in the body. And the, and, and the internal that like is 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 facilitating um, like like my hope that is facilitating um, the next step I'm gonna take. Yes. And in the next and, and when you're in these situations, every step that you take feels so critical. And like 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 you don't see ten years out, you don't see five years out, you don't see being patient, being processed. You are in death. You are like in structural violence. Last thing I would say before I move on is that um, I was a high honor roll student and at some point, like the things that I was seeing and living through and feeling and connected to, I felt like it made sense. I felt like my only option was to go to the streets. I felt like my only options was to, was to live a certain thing because of who I thought I was, what I thought my community was, how we interacted with each other, and with society, the media, scholarship, Super predator, all those things have told about us. You're super predators. You know, black people are lazy. Black women don't do nothing. Um, your moms, like all these things. I, 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 was, I was holding those things. And, and I went deep, deep into hurting myself and hurting my community. And it led to me catching a case when I was 21 um, for homicide. And when I was locked up, my son and my wife, um, in the building right here, um, my son was six months in my wife's um, womb when I got locked up for homicide. And that was a deep reflection for me. I had to really pause and I had to really wrestle with the fact, because a lot of the conversations I had with myself growing up, watching my moms and, my, and our family go through it, I was like, damn, mom. I used to tell my moms too, like, like, but I didn't really understand. But the question that I was asking, I was like, if you wasn't ready to have ch children, like, why did you have it now? Um, 
And I was telling her that, like, when, 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 when it's my turn, if I ever decide to have children, I would, like, try to, like, but when I was having a child, I was in prison. Yeah. Um, and I was grappling with the same thing that I was trying to question her about. Um, and that process put me through my own, like, like Topeka was saying, my own spiritual process, my own healing process, my own transformation um, to start thinking about who I am and how I show up and what I've been through. And I started reading and I started learning and I started putting myself in different situations. And inside of prison, I met other brothers who were doing the same thing. And through those conversations over the last four years I was in prison, um, those healing circles started to develop into ideas of what we call Holland now, how our lives link all together. Um, so me and these brothers, we um, were standing on a lot of prison history from New York, from Chicago, from LA, that came before us about people doing real rehumanizing work about how do you work through trauma in a dehumanizing place. And we started using that model to kind of like build with each other. And through those conversations, we were sharing real stories about ourselves, the guilt, the hurt, the shame, the ways we didn't show up, the ways we felt confused the ways we was fronting, throwing on masks, trying to be something that we wasn't. And we was honest with each other and we was building and through those conversations over years, we started saying, how do we get this back to our young people? How do we get this back to our block? Um, and through that, we started co-constructing how our lives link all together. And um, currently right now, um, we, you know, we got Alex and Kiran in the building. Um, the goal was that like the neighborhoods that we live in and the, and, and the, and, 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 and the conditions of those neighborhoods along with the prison system, were no places for us to raise our young people, our future. Um, so the, the structural conditions in our neighborhood yeah. that facilitate interpersonal yeah. conditions in our neighborhood yeah. are not a condition for our young people. And punishing that dynamic by sending us to prison isn't a condition for our young people either. Um, so we need to create a space where we can talk about leadership, healing, um, and transformation, and, 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 and do that with our young people that didn't rely on prison, and, and we start to holler. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of questions. Um, thank you all so much for sharing these stories. Um, uh, there's definitely questions about gender in here, but I'm not gonna go to gender right away. Um, I guess I do, you know, what's interesting is we actually just closed, every year we do an invest in youth grant cycle. Um, we deploy over two and a half million dollars annually to young people um, in under-resourced communities in Brooklyn largely. Um, and healing justice uh, is just, at this cycle started to pop up in a lot of the grants. And I met with one of my colleagues said, you know, Cecilia, we need to look a little deeper into this concept of healing justice. Um, it wasn't just Hala. Um, and I think that hearing three um, very clear stories about trauma, and, and in essence, what, what it really, the common denominator here is the trauma of systemic and structural racism, right? And um, so I guess I'd like to know, what does healing justice mean? Obviously, it's connected with this trauma. Where did it come from? And what does the movement for healing justice look like in your perspectives? I mean, um, Corey, you use that very clearly as an organizer. We could start with you, but I would love for the two of you to speak about it as well. Yeah, um, for Hala, healing justice is um, it's a, it's a framework, it's pedagogy, and it's organizing for us. So we see it on three different levels. Um, as a framework, it's really a, a deep understanding analysis that understands that that, that social development, that trauma, that, that, that oppression is, has a historical, like what we see today has historical roots that we can't just look at today um, at like the school to prison pipeline um, or stop and frisk or the immigration stuff that Trump is saying today without like tracing the roots of it. Um, secondly, we understand that healing is a collective process, that you can't heal alone, that you gotta heal in community with people. And, and collect in collectivity with people. Um, third, we really believe that um, that as we do, um, um, like, and that healing starts with the with the self. That it starts local, and and, and you know that could mean a bunch of stuff. You know, with the self meaning like internal, like how you internalize stuff. Um, also, local is like within your family, within your home. Like healing happens within homes. 
like, and then another local part is like your blocks next to you. And then another local is you formerly incarcerated, the community of formerly incarcerated people. Whatever the communities that you're close to, it, it, it starts with a really intentional process that healing local, healing, healing, healing is, 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 is important for moving outward. Um, and then um, as pedagogy, um, how do you create platforms, activities, um, curriculum, um, um, environment that understands people's deep trauma around gender, around mass incarceration, around sexuality, around, like, and you gotta, like, you know, we from, like, I know, I'm from, I'm from old school black. Uh, so I know how we show up on things taken, on Thanksgiving, on Christmas, um, on, on, on when we just on a corner chilling in, or we just in a hallway. Like, those, those are, like, moments to analyze, to say, how does the interpersonal dynamics play out? How do some of these larger issues play out in our real relationships? Um, so it's about honoring how we all been hurt in different ways based on our blackness, our brownness, our queerness, and really creating the conditions and that, that welcomes all of that trauma in so that we can start sharing that in, in a way that's about moving us forward. And that takes intention, that takes study to understand how to bring people together so that you can get to a point where everybody feel like they can go deeper or let some vulnerability out. And then the last thing, I would say is that, and as far as an organizing practice, is that um, a lot of people, and we are one of the people too, Holland and Center for New Leadership, think that healing and transformation happen at the policy level. And from our 50 years of organizing, like we don't want mad policies. And like from even the reason why we know about um, stop and frisk is because we organized and got them to disclose how they stop and frisk people. That's the reason why we was able to count how many times they stopped and frisk. And when you look under the policy when we win, when you go to Brownsville, when you go to South Jamaica, when you go to the middle of Queensbridge projects, our life still feel the same. Like even when we win the policy, our life, because the policy still got to be facilitated and implemented um, by people. And the culture of white supremacy, the culture of racism, the culture, regardless of like, I'm talking about people's hearts, people's spirit. Like policy can't change that. Um, so the kind of organizing work that we do is about changing people's hearts and spirits. It's about transformation. So we definitely target policies, all of them. And we understand, because we won policy already, that like transformation and healing doesn't just happen at the policy level. So we make sure that while we're fighting for policy, that we are definitely doing human justice building with, with, with all of our people for individual transformation as well. Damn, That's Corey. Fantastic. <laughs> Damn, Corey. <laughs> I think Corey covered it. <laughs> So, so I, I just want to say that when I started A New Way of Life, I didn't have the words or the framework to actually talk about this sort of justice healing work. Mm -hmm. What I had, though, was the action mm -hmm. that created a, a, a safe, welcoming household where we could bond, live, and support one another through the healing process. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the organizing sort of frame, but I, I began to understand my voice is powerful, mm -hmm. and I need to go in those places and speak truth to power and make people uncomfortable about what they're doing to us. Mm -hmm. And that began it for me. You know, it, it, it was such a, um, an eye-opener for me to go to Santa Monica, a beach community, a wealthy beach community, and watch how those individuals was treated when they were arrested for crack or drunk driving or possession of a coral, you know, these, these charges, they got deferred to treatment. They didn't get put on a chain gang and sent to work for eight cents an hour. They got a court card. I can remember being in a meeting and a man stood up and began to talk about how he hated the color green 
because he drove under the influence, had an accident, hurt people, and he was sentenced to community service and had to train, had to paint the jail green. And I'm sitting there after six pri prison terms where I hurt no one. I medicated my grief and pain after a law enforcement officer killed my five-year-old son. And I'm thinking, damn, I had to live in it over and over and over again. So leaving there and coming back to South LA, I, I was just like, I got to do something to try to recreate that experience mm -hmm. and help my community heal. Because I learned something out there. I learned a new approach. Because I thought it was, that's what happened. You, you, you break the law, you go to jail. Taking drugs is against the law. Even though it was all I had after my son left. So I didn't have the framework for it. You know, I didn't have the <laughs> healing justice, but I knew Question. what was happening Spirit. was wrong mm -hmm. and something had to be done. So I just, you know, clanged my little pennies together and, and, and out of it grew a house where women could <laughs> come together and make a community and support one another and grow stronger. And I just want to add to what both of you said. Um, the healing, a part of healing justice also is this. You know, people who have lived the experience, who are the best mentors and who have all the knowledge and who can then guide, right? and change and transform not only our communities within our communities, but within ourselves. You know, every time I come and I'm able to be around someone else who has experienced the same things that I've had and get poured in in the way that this is happening, that's part of healing. And so it's important to continue to provide platforms like this, right? And to provide access and resources for people who are doing this work so that we can continue to heal our communities because we are healing each other. It's awesome. Um, so really great. One of the things I just heard listening to the three of you, by the way, um, to prepare for this, I went online um, and I, cause I wanted to see, there are quite a few videos of uh, new way of life, um, kind of a day in the life of new way in life. And they're really beautiful documentaries. They're, you know, some are five minutes, some are 20 minutes. And I kind of couldn't stop watching them because I just want to tell you that the, even this sense of healing justice when, you know, Susan, in some of the videos, you just turn around and you're just like, anything you want, we're here for you. And there's so much power in that. So, you know, when I think about healing on that, just such a deep, and you know, lots of people are crying in those videos, but they're really crying from joy. Mm -hmm. And I think they're crying from a sense of justice and healing and relief. Um, and you have started that and now you're modeling that and you're all doing this work. Um, so I want to commend you for that, but also I just recommend you look at the videos because um, they're really incredibly moving. And one of the things I like that the three of you touched on is that clearly, and I don't think you need to name it, but we'll name it for now, Healing Justice, um, there is a relationship here between what you can do interpersonally and in your community and with those you love and what you can do on the bigger, in the macro, right, on the policy yeah. level. And, and that, Susan, you kind of came to that because, well, first of all, you understood how white people live, mm -hmm. uh, which apparently is very different, um, which they're painting the jail that you're in, yeah. right? Um, and, um, and so you know there's something wrong, and you know the history that I think Corey spoke about yeah. so beautifully. Um, so I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about this, this, the necessity of both the, the really deep work but also the policy work. And I know, Susan, you had a huge uh, triumph in California, Prop 47, which we'll talk about. Uh, we've had some really great victories here, uh, certainly Raise the Age. New York was about 49 states behind raising the age of criminal responsibility from children to still young adults, but, um, and then also recently closed Rikers, um, and uh, which is, <laughs> interestingly, now, technically, a policy, we'll see about the implementation, so I do think 
making the distinction between policy change and implementation is really, really sound point. Um, but do you want to talk a little bit about some of your, that you ended up doing policy work even though you just thought you were buying a house for some women. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, what I began to recognize is that um, a house and a, a place to come back to wasn't enough. There were structural barriers, mm -hmm. structural racism, straight disinvestment, and inequality that was just humongous, no matter how hard and how consistently we worked to, to, to raise ourselves up out of the, the, the bottom, there was always these things that kept us from rising. So we got into uh, organizing and policy and ballot initiatives. And you know, our ancestors um, uh, died and were bitten by dogs and were sprayed with with water hoses, hung from trees around voting, just being able to cast a vote. So um, it's important that we exercise that, that right to vote and that we organize and go into places where uh, people are, are held and, 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 and kept from voting, held on this uh, uh, wretched bail system and kept from voting. So we um, organized around voting in 2014, 2012, 2010, 2008, and in 2014 it kind of paid off in a big way because there was a ballot initiative, Proposition 47, Proposition 47 reduced six misdemeanors, uh, to six felonies to a misdemeanor, nonviolent um, uh, um, drug possession, um, um, oh, what, what are, drug possession, mm -hmm. receiving stolen property, writing a bad check, petty theft, um, forgery for less than $800, and um, it's one other one, I can't, can't think of it, one other one, but they, they reduced all of these to, to misdemeanors. It took $100 million that was transferred out of the state prison system back into the community, uh, and it created a program, a victims, a victims, uh, victims fund, uh, drug treatment, mental health, uh, and uh, uh, K through 12 school, that money went into those pots and we're just now, that money is just now hitting the community. But what it also did is that, you know, it took, it, it's, I wanna say, I use the phrase, it took the wind out of law enforcement and state prisons because the day that measure passed, the next day they had to open the gates and people flowed out by the thousands back into the community from county jail and from prisons. And also uh, those that had to actually, uh, some people had to file to reduce the, the, um, the, the measure to, the, Produce, to reduce the drug possession to a misdemeanor, and then and then they they flowed out, and our legal department helped to implement that, and we're still implementing it. I myself have my drug charges reduced to a misdemeanor, but um, it it it, show, it it kind of put faith back into our um, the low voter turnout community that our vote does matter, and my homeboys are coming home, and my mom's coming home, and my sister and cousin is coming home because I cast that vote. And so after that, we did Proposition 57, which gave people more credits that they could come home, but it's ongoing, and, and we went into the jails. The sheriff tried to keep us out of the jails. We filed a suit through the legal department to get access to people inside that we could register them, register them to vote. And, and, and you know, I tugged and I fussed and I called my supervisor and I'm like, the sheriff's got to open up the doors and let us in there because we register our folks to vote even there. And we did. And we went back to ensure that they cast their vote. But this is, this is the, the work that really energizes me. And I'm glad to see these young people here because I don't know how long the work going to keep energizing me. <laughs> but these are the things that I'm not we worried. did. And, and, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, um, you know, um, 
I feel like I got a foothold. And, and, and I'm not stopping. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna raise as many Topeka Sams up as I can. And I brought with me April Atkins. Wanna stand up, April? April, April just, just came home. Uh, and I want to thank, thank the Shackler uh, Foundation for bringing her with me. She just came home after uh, almost 28 years, 27 years, four months and five days or something like that. She's been home a, a, a few months now. And, and, and so we're going to keep, you know, exposing and, and raising people up and bringing them home and, 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 and exposing them and encouraging them. So, yeah. So I just went on one, yeah. So. I love that. We love that. We yeah. love it. Uh, do either of you want to speak a little bit about policy before I? No. no. You're good. So I, I do want to talk about gender um, because I do think, and if you look at research and statistics, that trauma. So a lot of this trauma is shared um, by people of color um, because of structural racism, and then I think there's another layer of gendered violence that has brought trauma into communities for women. Um, and in fact, if you look at the research around women who are incarcerated, they estimate that maybe up to 90% of women who are incarcerated have in fact survived sexual violence or certainly gendered violence. So, um, which does not mean that men who are incarcerated themselves are, have not been traumatized by violence, but I do think that their gender is playing a role in terms of the violence. So, um, and both of you have started programs for women. Um, and Corey, of course, you're welcome to also speak about. Um, I'm curious, in fact, in your original group with Hala, uh, if women were at the table, not obviously while you're inside, but later. Um, so anyway, could any of you, or would any of you like to speak with that, speak to that? So, I'll, you know, I'll talk about it. And in the book, I write about a long history of trauma and violence um, that I experienced prior to incarceration. And what um, I've come to the place that um, uh, among, among black women, among poor communities, is what we do in this country is actually uh, uh, incarcerate trauma instead of address it in a way that you know can be resolved you know in Santa Monica again you know things happen out there too you know but but I went to therapy every week and they get to go to therapy every week and have a place to actually uh, other you know other communities other people have the resources that 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 they can go and they can work through it in a way that it's not internalized mm -hmm. it's not digested as me not being enough or um, uh, I turn around and become harmful because I'm harmed so much. Uh, so the disinvestment in our communities still come to, to my mind here around addressing trauma and not only the disinvestment but the overinvestment in law enforcement and tactics of oppression and suppression that, that we experience which is another form of trauma. Uh, yes. And you know, they say uh, in LA, I don't know what y'all got on your police car to protect and serve, but we say who? Who are you protecting and who are you serving? Uh, but um, you know, in, in, in our homes, you know, there is a safe environment that people can actually, women can sit in a circle and talk about, you know, what their experience has been. But also, there's a therapist you know, that every Thursday, you can go and sit down with him. You have the choice to, and it has to be your choice. It's not a mandate from me, even though I might feel like you would be, uh, uh, it would be to your advantage to go. It has to be your personal choice and desire to actually go and, and talk. We call him Dr. Phil. And uh, uh, we got our own Dr. Phil, <laughs> you know, and if they're not comfortable with Dr. Phil, we have another therapist that's on, on, on staff under Dr. Phil that they can sit with who is a woman. So uh, I think it's really, you know, um, it, it's, it's real that we, we incarcerate trauma. Mm -hmm. 
instead of instead of provide the resources, which would be much easy, much much more effective, and much more much more cost effective, and better for us and our communities. Uh, and um, uh, we, as frontline community warriors, you know, must be the resource that we see needs to happen. I'm curious, did any of you receive? counseling, therapy, mental health services while incarcerated? I um, went to a trauma class, and when I was in that trauma class is when I found out that I was a victim <coughs> of sexual abuse. I didn't know. I mean, I was in a relationship, and I thought that this is my boyfriend, and I was told that this is what you do when you're in a relationship, you know, even though I may have said no. And so, you know, I realized that that has happened to a lot of women you know, that you do not know that you're actually a victim or a survivor until someone has told you what those things are. And so I too have learned in, in the incarceration and even in having access to mental health that there was something that had happened to me that had also changed a part of me in my life and that until I was able to understand what that was and that I had certain rights that that changed. So these, that's another example of what happens to women and specifically women of color. A lot of times when abuse and things, when you talk about histories and things that have gone, the lineage and the ancestry and during slavery, the things that have happened to our grandmothers and mothers and then happened to us, it's that thing that we're told to go pray. You know, and you prayed away. And so, and then you don't talk about it. And yet you don't realize that you're internalizing this. You know, and then it changes the, I mean, the way you see things. And so we don't know. And again, that's the, the part of the healing justice and having access and bringing these resources and things within our communities and within our homes so that women do understand that they do have choices, right? Yeah, Thank the, you, Tupi. Yeah, I, I would just add on, um, I, think, um, yeah, I think most people in prison are people who experience trauma. And I think, like I was saying earlier, when you think about, particularly thinking about gender, like when you dive into like how we've been socialized from our gender places, it gives you more insights about what that violence has been. Um, so I would assume, because my experience in prison, like when you are in that experience of deep kill, of deep dehumanization, and you're trying to fight for your life, um, you're building with people in deep ways. So I'm pretty sure, like Topeka, like beyond what we know statistically, have deep wisdom about what in those circles and those spaces that y'all have with women about what it means to like, and then another thing like my wife who, like we also think about like the 2.3 million people in prison or the whatever, 8 million people on papers, but we don't think about the communities and the families who love us, um, who are in prison with us, um, who gotta like go through visits, who gotta get violated, who gotta like be separated from their family. Um, so I think there's another, if, you, if we was to put our analysis in, on gender violence in that category and see um, our women and our sisters and our siblings who love us while we are in prison, um, I think that's another kind of like opening of like how, it, how trauma works. Trauma, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I, listening to Sirens all day coming down, it, 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 it's trauma. You know, you know something has happened. Mm -hmm. What has happened? Where are they going? Who is it? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, so, we, would any of you like to say something before we go into audience Q&A um, about this topic, something that you think is important to share? You know, I want to give a really, really good uh, open example of what's happening right now in relation to the opioid crisis. Mm. Mm -hmm. In our country's response to the opioid crisis, so I already experienced this response 20 years ago in Santa Monica when the guy was painting the jail uh, instead of uh, where I had to live in the jail. But, you know, the opioid crisis is uh, hitting a different segment um, uh, of America than the uh, co cocaine epidemic or the cocaine um, attack that happened in black communities. And while I, I, I think that uh, there should be a response that says this is a, a health issue, but when it was us, it was a criminal issue. Mm -hmm. 
And we just all have to uh, be um, cognizant and aware and not actually just like sweep that under the carpet and let it pass without giving it the type of attention and recognition of what's happening and what's been happening. And we need people to just be cognizant of that and um, you know, rallying for more resources for communities, a different approach to safety. You know, our communities are not safe with more police. Mm. Our communities would be safe with victim services, therapy services, mental health services, arts, recreation. I was looking at the, 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 the things that, that, that were going on in the museum today. You know, same things that make other communities safe, make our communities safe, prosper, and instill hope for a better life. And, 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 and so, you know, we need all of you to be thinking and, 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 and pouring the resources in that our community needs and, and thinking about a better approach to what a safe community means. That's, That's my piece. That's excellent and a great place to... <laughs> to finish, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna actually ask Ron, who's here from Hala, Ron, uh, to start us off with a question. Um, and there are microphones on both sides and uh, we really encourage you to ask these extraordinary panels um, any questions. Ask the question, don't go home thinking about it. <laughs> Excellent advice. All right, so um, y'all talk about healing for about approximately 45 minutes now, and I was listening, and um, Topeka, this is for you and for everybody on the panel. Um, so you have experienced healing justice, but you have experienced it with the Youth Organizing Collective. How has that experience helped you to do the work you are doing right now? And for people who don't know what healing justice is, I would love to get involved and also want to help Holler to achieve his healing justice movement. Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, so when I was invited by Corey to come experience the circle, um, it was life-changing for me because it was led by the young people. And it was dynamic because they were, the, the engagement was very, well, the knowledge and the level of engagement um, really changed my life. And it opened me to be able to share in a way that I was able to touch, but also be touched. Um, to sit directly in front of someone who is younger than you, you, where you can see your younger self. And to really understand you know, what you're saying, how that can affect their lives, but also seeing yourself. So it was felt like I was talking to myself, um, that it was extremely powerful. And so, you know, just thinking about also working with you all and bringing that into Hope House for the women, because that, that takes part of healing with the children, right? And building from that. And so I would encourage, as far as getting involved with Hala, I mean, afterwards to see one of you or to Corey, um, and to continue to, one, get engaged in the circle, right? Um, because it was everyone there. It was black, white, brown, everyone was there. And um, everyone actually, I, I felt like there was kind of like a, a release, you know, afterwards. It, it was, it was just a great experience. Cool. Um, also, I have a question for Corey, too. This, this ain't biased, bruh. Um, Corey, I want you to tell everyone in the room your perspective, what healing justice means to you. Again? <laughs> to you. This is your perspective of healing justice on the inside. On a local level, it means, like what I said earlier, like me, my wife is here, my son is here. Um, we love each other, um, but like real family and like real people, we have real issues that, that make our love complicated. Um, so what it means to me is really like, like honoring and grappling with the ways that like I play a part in complicating our relationship and trying to build with my family and creating a situation where we can see each other in a full way. Um, so on a, it, it starts with what I said earlier, it really is about building, expanding hope. Mm -hmm. um, it's, about, it's about shared leadership. Um, 
It's about, it's about understanding how you hurt other people and how you may hurt, even whether you know it or not, consciously or unconsciously, how, because how people have been raised or what they experience or how they internalize stuff, like just you being you sometime, even when you don't have any bad intentions to it. And this is particularly like, you know, um, for dudes who are in spaces with women, for white people who are in spaces with a lot of black people, like just you being you and who you've been socialized maybe landing on somebody in a real bad way because you're not, because if you're not conscious, so, so it starts with like loving my family and figuring out how I could be better as a father, as a husband, um, and, 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 and taking that into my movement of social justice and sharing that with the world. It's about deep vulnerability. It's about owning, your f owning the hardest parts. It's about working through fear. The last thing I would say is about working through fear because sometimes we are worried about how... It, it, so it's a lot of self-love um, to help you work through fear and to help you dive into a vulnerable place where I believe is a lot of our magic powers at. Um, so that's all I would say, too. So this is a, a sort of an honor for me, too. And I, this is a question I have for... For Susan, um, so this was a it was a long-term executive director of a community agency on the Upper West Side, and spent over 40 years doing community work. And when I retired this year, uh, they named the book. Was, I was worked for the Goddard Riverside Community Center on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and similar issues. And they named it the uh, the Goddard Riverside Stephen Russo Book Prize for Social Justice. And the winner this year, the first year, was. Uh, was becoming Miss Burton Sue, Sue's book, which is uh, quite moving, and I just I'm very honored that uh, that the book that was named after my career, that Sue's was uh, and the New Press was one, and Sue was the the book um, was the first year winner. So it's really really very moving, and thank you. Um, my question for you, Susan, what 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 struck me was, um, could you talk a little bit about your process for writing the book, um, because. You know, there are a lot of different experiences and different ways that we express it, but it, it's a real leap to be able to figure out how to put it down in such a, such a way that you did in a book. And so a little bit about how you did that and how your whole experience and what you went through and, and the organization that sort of became this book that, uh, you know, it's a way of sharing it with so many other people. So um, I think the process for me um, understanding the journey, the, the my life uh, trajectory started with the reading of the new Jim Crow. And because the depth of the injustice, I knew there was stuff that ha that happened that shouldn't have happened but the depth of it um, and our government's um, interaction with that produced some of the experiences and the environment that came out of the environment in which our government was really uh, accomplice in producing allowed me to go back and re-examine not only my life, but my parents' life. And that's where I began to really line up my experiences that um, landed me into much of the harm and the pain that I experienced. So I started with my mother and father running from the deep south, Texas, looking for a better life and a better place to raise their children and be, and you know, the, the came to California, the land of milk and honey, but they landed in the projects. An area had, that had been constructed to receive black people fleeing from the South. Mm -hmm. They had already laid the plan out. Mm -hmm. And my mother and father, uns we know, and just like fell into it. Mm -hmm. And I talk about playing jacks. Mm -hmm. 
on the, on, on the floor mm -hmm. of the projects, which were concrete, and I loved playing jacks there because the ball bounced real high, and I could swoop my jacks, and I could catch the ball, and I could, I could be a good jacks player. But later, I would be walking on semen floors in prison, and there were no jacks. There was a job that paid me eight cents an hour. And so I, I went through my early life. I went through year by year by year, starting with my, my mom and experience by experience and by experience. And it was painful. At one part, one, one, one morning, I remember waking up in my living room and there was a ball of sadness around me as big as this room. And I just had to sit there in it and say, how do, does a little girl, how does a little girl, a woman be treated this way? How could, how could the response be so cruel and so harmful? But then I, I checked back in with my therapist and went to a few sex, uh, sessions. And then it was like, but damn, I survived it and I'm kicking butt now. You know, and so I, I got to the uh, second half of becoming Miss Burton, uh, the half where Miss Burton is developing fully and wholly and powerfully. Uh, but it was a year and three months of, of, of reliving uh, colors and characters and feelings and taste and uh, pain and hurt and victory and, you know, insights. And so it was, um, I needed to do that. We need to talk about women in mass incarceration. Women are the fastest growing segment of the prison system. We need to talk about what happens when all of the men have been, most of the men, not all of the men, most of the men have, um, been, uh, been, been, been labeled second class, and now you're coming after the women. What's left for our children? What's left for our community? So we need to talk about that and what that, what that looks like and what that brings. So, so that's, that was the reasoning around uh, writing the book. I didn't know it was gonna get your award. <laughs> so that, that's, just, that's just the cherry on top. Thank you so much for being here. Yes. Oh, who got there at first? I don't want to. All right, go ahead. Um, thank you guys all for talking. Um, I know when I was incarcerated, I did like a lot of uh, motivating and uh, counseling and things like that, but it weighed heavy on me, but I always had somebody I can go to, which was a facilitator or something. Who feeds you guys? After you give all that you have to everybody else, who feeds you? Who, 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 who gives it to you? Great question. Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> so what, a lot of people. Watching you take pictures yesterday was, was, was food for my soul. Yeah, I would say, um, yeah, my mom's. You know, I start off the story with my mom's because my mom's is still struggling. Like, she's calling me, like, literally right now, probably. Um, and texting me, um, but she's still fighting, and that strength is just beautiful. That's a beautiful strength to like hold on to and be close to. Um, the people that, that touch me in prison, there's so many people that bless me with wisdom, with potential, with hope that would never come out of prison the way the system is designed, who just gave it to me, see me in the yard, and like invested deepness in me as a way of, of, way of like living for themselves. Um, but it may have been selfish for them in that moment, but it was really, it was really precious for me because I didn't even understand who I was. Um, my son, um, my wife, um, I can just keep going, YOC, like our young people, like just seeing Kiran and Alex in the building, um, we got two programs that our young people are going through an 18 month like leadership process. We spend a lot of time together, like three times a week, six hours at a time. That's not even talking about when we gotta prep for like a panel like this or anything else. We just spend a lot of time together and we struggle, but to see that the, the, the transformation that they're taking as individuals, um, it lets us know that the work that we're doing, to see Susan, to see Topeka, to see the work that formerly incarcerated folks are doing, it lets us know that we're still alive and that, that, that we still gotta add on. 
Um, so I'm motivated by, by us um, and by my connection to me that know that I'm us. You know? And who feeds me? Uh, my sister's inside. Mm -hmm. Like I get co emails and phone calls every single day. Um, women who have life sentences and double life sentences, 13 life sentences, and who may never even come home if policies don't change, right? First time offenses. And when I get a call from them and they just want to know what's going on and that they're proud because with the hope that they have of one day coming home that they're hoping to come to Hope House, you know, that allows me to know that I have to move. Like, you know, that gives you the energy to say that sisters are being released every single day and someone has to be there to receive them. You know, when I think about Susan in 1998, and where was I in 1998? And where am I now, just starting the things that she's done for decades? And what is it gonna look like decades from now? You know, that what feeds me, to understand that, you know, you're moving in, in, in purpose. You know, that's you. You feed me. Quasia feeds me, you know? Hey, uh, Corey, you talked about the need and the lack of opportunity for people of color, people who are, um, you know, in the LGBT community um, to, to kind of get help and also to connect with their vulnerabilities. So are your organizations kind of, do you think this is a, a concern, right, to, to help out the LGBT community and kind of are the current opportunities out there for people of color, women and children, kind of encompassing of LGBT struggles as well? Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think it's definitely of a concern. Um, I think, like I said earlier, I think there's a lot of policy and political climate stuff that we can address around LGBTQ stuff. But just thinking about us and healing justice and just thinking about our own internal spaces, thinking about our own communities. Um, there's a lot of healing that we got to do amongst ourselves around how we show up around other people's humanity. Um, the stuff that we internalize about who we think we are versus who we think other people are. Um, so yeah, the, the work that I'm talking about, the curriculum that we design, the space that we do in HALA, um, it's not perfect, you know, we're always learning, but the intention is that we're trying to create a space that brings in all our humanities so that our young people are, are learning, studying um, the history of some of these topics. Um, we're bringing our real life experience. Some of us are queer, some of us is trans, um, so our crew is undocumented, formerly incarcerated, queer, trans. We got like four um, sisters. We got some South Asians. We got a young white youth um, who's been, who grew up in Bushwick. Who's um, so we have a really dope collective that have a like 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 standpoints of really deep experiences and deep wisdom. Um, so for us to function every day, um, we got to be intentional about how we create that space to welcome folks in. Um, but on a larger thing, I think, um, yeah, I think like there's a lot of conversations around policy um, outside of our immediate space, in our homes, um, in the culture of our world, in the workplace, um, that like, yeah, like black LGBTQ, um, black trans, like it's not just LGBTQ, when you throw trans and you throw blackness on top of those things, those things complicate the issue even more. So yeah, we need to keep having more conversations about that. And I mentioned that point because a lot of times when we talk about LGBTQ issues, like, like I'm connected to a lot of like, 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 like trans identifying folks and they are not even in that conversation sometimes because their, their transness and their blackness um, still doesn't fit the model what LGBTQ should look like or should roll out like with. So it's a lot of like work around like, um, like who fits the, the category of LGBTQ and who is still excluded from that too. Um, so it's just a lot of work that we all, like this is another thing about healing justice, um, it's about your own work, your own individual work that you need to do to, to understand what humanity is going through. Like, even though I'm not queer, I'm not trans, I don't mean it's not my job to understand and, and learn more about what queer and trans people are going through in my community, if, I'm, if I say that's my community. Um, so I think, so the point that I'm saying is that we all, every day, every second, every conversation, we should be working on our individual transformation to move us to a different place. And I, I just like to add that um, people 
all people, leaving those places of torture, those places of confinement, those places of exploitation, uh, our, our criminal justice, our injustice, our, our jail, leaving chains, leaving captivity, coming back to our community, need a safe place to land where they can be welcomed, where they can heal. And that's all communities across this country. So um, what, what, what we're doing at A New Way of Life is working in, in, with uh, a UCLA to create a model replication uh, a study to roll out next year the opportunity for people to learn from our model um, how to do effective community-based grassroots underground railroad reentry. And that includes all communities. Uh, so, so that's you know where uh, you know my next phase of development is to support the development of safe homes nationally. And Topeka opened the first one in um, the for the Bronx on October 28th. But we're going to scale it up. We hope Brooklyn is next, Topeka. Yeah. <laughs> So we have time maybe for two more questions and then- You have four more people. I know. So how about four more questions, but we're super efficient. Yeah. And then don't forget that Susan's gonna be here signing her book. Uh, I hope you all got a copy of a book on the way in. We're gonna be signing on the right. Um, but, um, but if we don't get to all your questions, then you know, I, I hope the three, three of you will be hanging around a little to answer questions, but go for it. Okay, this is a next. hard question. So brace yourselves. Okay. <laughs> what is justice? Oh, it's for all. <laughs> yeah, justice is justice is me. Yeah. Justice is young and dope. Grassroots leadership being shown in Brooklyn Museum on a public stage. This is what it looks like. This is what it smells like. Um, justice is. Um, yeah, I think it depends on what time frame we in in history. I think about, it depends on what's the conversation, who's in the room. <laughs> so, because justice means different things to who, what we speaking to. So, but I think it, I think it means, um, it means, it means facing um, like, like um, the history of things that denied our ideas of what justice may be. Um, and then it also means investing um, and the communities and the people um, who receive some of the brutal end of that injustice. Um, like, you got like two dope, dope black same. women up here on a panel who are formerly incarcerated, and you got me who's also formerly incarcerated up here. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is what justice looked like. This is what it smelled like. Like, we need more. This needs to be normal more. Yeah. Um, we need to, we, like, justice is really like coming up with a new normal and reshaping some of the relationships that we have with institutions, that we have with who's an expert. But we, sorry. Yeah, and I think it's this, the same for you as it is for me. The same for the West Side, the East Side, the Bronx, Manhattan, as it is for, for, for the next person. And, and I guess equality, you know, real equality. Okay. I would just say justice is love. I was going to say that too. Yeah. 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 So we say the same thing. So somebody go. I just stood up for y'all. Somebody jump up. <laughs> okay. So I'm a former high school teacher, uh, and I have been following the conversation around restorative justice a lot. And I know that that's a little different from the framework of healing justice. I imagine you all are supporters of restorative justice as a concept, but I'm wondering if there are any nuances or watch outs or sort of critiques you would have of that movement in schools right now? I don't want to be guilty before I'm restored. Mm. Mm. I, you know, don't, don't tell me, you know, I, I, I don't want to be guilty um, uh, before I can get some restoration, you know, restore me, you know, yeah. So, so you got to watch who's, who's pushing restorative justice out. And also restorative, from what I understand about the teachings and the history, like as an indigenous person, 
Um, I'm keep throwing that out there because I feel like restorative circling is an indigenous practices. And it's not just about when so-called conflict happens, it's about how we govern our life. How we hold space, how we build relationships, how we build institutions, how we build babies, how we build community. We're always in circle. We don't just do it when so-called conflict happens. Um, so I think part of my thing is that um, the way it rolls out in school, I think um, it's not for one culturally, it's not something that's culturally in the whole institution. Like the principal, dean, and superintendent, none of them are going through the circle process. Um, it's just about the young people who are bad in a certain moment. Maybe teachers who are like dealing with that every day are more in it, but it's not a cultural foundational principle to governing an everyday cultural life. Um, so for me, I feel like when you, like it, it loses a lot of its history and its philosophy of why it's important, why it brings people together, why people are able to show up a certain way when they're always in it, a step from when you just send them in there when they go into the box or when they go into the dean. Um, so, so I feel like, and I, I, Hollis started off in schools. Like our first, when we came out of prison in 2009, our first four years was volunteering in public schools in New York City with the at-risk youth. And the way policy is so like flooded on public schools in New York, like deans and principals are, are, are being impacted by that policy too because they're teachers, assessment. Um, so there's all kinds of like, so the school situation to me is just, that's a site of extreme like fair. Everybody is like fair from their school getting closed, fair that I'm gonna get a bad score on my testing thing, that I'm not gonna be a good teacher anymore, fear that I'm gonna be a one. As a student, you're fear that you're gonna be a one, that you ain't gonna be a four. A four means that you are, you're good in all your stuff, you're gonna be a one. So all these test things, zero, it's a lot of fear that I think is counterproductive too to like the philosophy of where restorative justice is. I can just keep going, but I think, I also think it's really important too, though, to bring people together and to negotiate stuff, but I think, like, yeah, we need to be honest about the things that, 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 that doesn't make sense in that situation too. Can I, I'm just gonna insert uh, the Brooklyn Community Foundation. Uh, three years ago, we launched a restorative justice pilot in Brooklyn, uh, in three high schools and a um, middle school. And um, I just, you know, to be clear, and I completely agree with, with my colleagues here on the stage, not my colleagues, but my friends here on the stage. We call it. All right, all right, all right, thank you. I'm not sure I deserve that place of honor, but um, uh, it is completely about the whole community and one thing. So one thing I'd say is check out our website about this project that we're doing. Um, and the second thing I'd say is you should look at transformative justice. One of, actually, one of the people delivering in our pilot um, really subscribes to this concept of transformative justice. Um, which really takes into account pretty much the conversation we've had here today, which is really looking at cumulative um, historic violence and trauma um, and what it brings into schools. But one thing I would say about restorative justice is at least mm -hmm. we are maybe reconsidering a conversation about thinking about children in any way that is punitive. Yeah. Um, and it's entirely rooted in racism and it's absolutely new Jim Crow. Um, so just even the idea that maybe there's an opportunity that we can rethink. And I, I think in some ways I would say that about justice. You know, there's a lot of uh, conversation now about it's not reproductive rights, it's reproductive justice. And I totally agree with that because I think it's really about reimagining. Um, so restorative justice definitely has some issues, but the idea that there's even an opportunity for a counter narrative, I think is what's really clear. So that would be my answer to your question. All right, sorry, it wasn't very efficient and I was saying that we should be efficient. Okay, go for it. Um, first off, I'd just like to say how inspirational it is to see three people that have worked through such tremendous trauma and have come to a place in their lives where they can express the power within themselves to um, both make, uh, you know, to be positive individuals, but also positive influences on their communities. And I was wondering if any, or if any of all, all of you had some sort of epiphanal moment where you kind of um, saw your way out of the cycle of trauma that is kind of internalized, I feel, or that well, at least I have found myself inter and with an internalized cycle of trauma and how you kind of got yourself out of that, both in terms of how you could ed um, enact personal growth, but then also how you could take that personal growth and start um, having that be a positive effect on your community. Um, I would say that um, for me, when I was able to actually 
um, see someone for and relate to someone, um, to see their experiences and humanize it, really. You know, because when we also think about racism and we think about privilege, you also have to think about that as the constructs of even within our race, um, Af African Americans. You know, and so for me, um, for me to be able to connect with other people of color who had different experiences than I, um, that were impacted by a system which I too end up being politicized after reading the new Jim Crow when I was inside, um, was something that had been built for generations and generations to come. So despite me thinking that it was an us and them, I was able to say, okay, this is me. And then once I went through that process of really understanding the things that brought them through trauma and then brought them to trauma and then brought them to incarceration where despite whatever experiences I had had in my life that may have been different than theirs, we ended up at the same place. So it was a common thread. And so I was able to heal because that was my moment where I said, okay, I see myself and I see what's happened to me and those before me and next to me. And so how do we begin this process of healing? And so that was my journey. And I write about in the book um, a, a day when I was incarcerated in prison in the sergeant's hall. And I stopped this instructor and I tell her about some things that happened in my childhood. And her response to me was, don't worry about passing my class you have enough to deal with. And that was the first time anyone had actually um, uh, verified something went really, really wrong in my life. And that began the process of introspect and healing, but it is a process. And I'm still in that process. I'm not done yet. There's more. Uh, but that was the pivotal aha moment for me. And this lady, she was feared. In order to get out of that particular prison, that particular prison sentence, I had to pass that class. Mm -hmm. And she was feared for flunking her entire class. But she said to me in this moment of pity, compassion, empathy, or whatever it was, she said, don't you worry about my class. And I was like, damn, something really went wrong. Mm -hmm. And then I could begin to really begin to look at what my experiences had been. And that it was like I got permission mm -hmm. in that moment uh, to begin the process of introspect and healing. Mm -hmm. And I'm still introspecting and healing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So. <laughs> That is Ellen Adler, right there, stand up Ellen. She published The New Jim Crow and Becoming Miss Burton along with a lot of other books. She is the publisher, yes. Um, and one of my, my goals and dreams um, and, and realities now is that Becoming Miss Burton is uh, going to be uh, made, uh, there's gonna be a prison edition. 11,000 books are being printed, especially just for people incarcerated. <clears throat> so next year I'll be going on a tour. My tour will consist, next, next, next year my tour will consist of be included women's prisons across the nation. And then in those prisons with those visits, I'll be looking for places to replicate a new way of life also. Um, I was in Alabama three weeks ago. I went there, they let hard copies in there. And I went there and a woman sat down next to me <clears throat> and she said, she was in prison for drug conspiracy. I mean, for drug trafficking. So it was she, I looked her up when I left. She said, I asked her when she was coming home. She said, she, she's never coming home. When I looked her up for 
trafficking drugs, and she's from New York, y'all. She got 999 years, 99 months, and 99 days for being on a train between uh, New York and Alabama with drugs. Yes, yeah, devastating. 99, 999 years, 99 months, and 99 days. And it's been searing into me, what are we gonna do about her? What can I do? Uh, so this prison tour, well, you know, I'm working on how, how to build a campaign for her. And now we have the opioid crisis, and it's yeah, a health problem. I bet you know. Should, uh, did you talk to Brian Stevenson when you were down in Alabama? I did. And the next day I went He'll to He'll take care of her. No. Maybe. The no? next day I went to Brian Stevenson's office, and I said, do you know Miss Cooley? And they said, Geneva. And they, they said, there's nothing we can do for her. Mm. There's a little glitch in the law that was passed for people like her, that excludes her. But I've been back in contact with him, mm. and we're looking at, I have the t attorneys at A New Way of Life also looking at it to see what we can do. But look at that sentence, and look at the health approach for opioid. Mm. You hear me? So, yeah. She's 70 years old. Wow. She's been in prison 15 years. Wow. And she's 70 years old. We're going to get her up out of there, right? Yeah. We're going to get her up out of there. All right. Good afternoon, everyone that's on the panel. Welcome back to a free world, not completely free, because it's something that you really have to fight for. Yeah. The important thing that I wanted to bring out is that in this country, until it hits home, nobody cares. Yes. No, everybody looks away until it hits their own house, their personal hearts and their personal minds. That's when they really start to think about how this system works. This system is really not about the little man, the little nine to fivers. This system is about the clock, how much you can put in before you leave this planet. We have to come together as a people and recognize that these people went through hell just to tell their stories. Just to be sitting there right now and sharing this, believe me, I know the gates are still in your hearts. The bars, the locks, the keys, the time, check in, check out. I have friends that have been incarcerated and they're working and they're doing their best, but it's still not good enough. Boredom and torture is very, very important for us to think about. Because in some family right now, someone is going through torture and they're going through boredom. Why do you think they came up with pre-K for every kid? Because those little kids was bored, sitting home, doing nothing all day. And so they came up with pre-K for everyone. They opened the gates for these little minds to start getting busy so they can stay out of mischief, so they can start doing things that's productive to society. We have to get on board and stop looking the other way, thinking, oh, it's not about me, I don't care. We gotta start looking at people like this, people who are trying to be good, people who are trying to do something better, and we got to give them the support they need. So my name is Patricia Hill. Anything you need me to do, you, I'm sitting right here. Just let me know if I could just start from point A and just continue going. Because we got to get involved. We got to stop looking the other way. People are coming in every day from different countries looking at us thinking that we're a bunch of idiots letting things like this happen. I'm watching a court show on TV where they have three judges to determine the decision of what's going on. We need more than 12 people to sit on a jury stand and determine what goes on. We need to change the structure. We need to get involved and know that one day, maybe one of ours will be sitting there. So I, I just Thank wanna you. say that all of us, we have organizations 
and, and, and you can support. You can support by going on Holla's website mm -hmm. um, and, and hit that. You got a donate now button up there? <laughs> we, all, we always, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, no amount of money is, is too small, and we love reoccurring money that we can, that, that, that we can, we, we can count on. So there's Holla's website, there's um, Hope House's website, and there's A New Way of Life's website. If you want to support with dollars, just go there and, and support us. And there's other things you can do, but I just wanted to put that out there. It's easy, reoccurring, whatever, and uh, support our work. We always need that unrestricted money to do things. One thing I want to ask you, your youth that are in the training program, are there, it, it felt like a little time. Yeah. Is there compensation for them yeah, for yeah. participating? Yeah. Right on. Supported by Brooklyn Community Foundation. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I gotta get your card. Yeah. Big round of applause for Susan Tamika. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So uh, I'm gonna sign books for whoever wants a signature. <laughs>